All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at the home office of the United Church of God in Milford, Ohio. We're about ready to begin. Sun has come out on us here. It's been storming on and off today where we have been here. But we have sunshine and people who are gathered here for the most part have full, full stomachs. We had dinner and now we're ready to get into um, some spiritual food in, in regard to this uh, tonight. So before I ask the blessing and get into it tonight, I, I, I want to mention that uh, I want to give proper attribution for the study tonight. Uh, the outline that I'm basing my study on tonight is, uh, is not original to me. I am uh, borrowing it from my youngest son, Ryan. Uh, about uh, a year and a half to two years ago, he gave a sermon um, over in Indianapolis on the subject of Ephesus. And uh, being the proud dad that I am, I listened to it and thought, I, I, said, I said to myself, I don't think I can do better than that at the time, long before we got into this Bible study series. So I, uh, when we, I drew the lot to do the city of Ephesus, or the church at Ephesus, I went back and listened to his uh, sermon, and um, he had a very, very good outline. So I'm basing that, uh, my presentation tonight on that. It's not often that a father in the ministry can do that. Uh, usually, perhaps the son is borrowing from the father, but in this case, the father's borrowing from the son. So I wanted to make sure I gave proper attribution and credit to my, to my son here tonight. But I'll, I'll ad lib and add in a few other things that uh, are my own original work and contribution as well. And... Um, but I do want to, wanted to acknowledge that. So, as we begin the Bible study tonight, let's go ahead and um, ask God's blessing. So if you all would please rise, I'll do so. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we bow before your holy throne. We come through the office of your Son, Jesus Christ, as our High Priest. Father, and humbly ask you to guide and direct this study. We also know, Father, that your Son is the head of the church, the living head of the, the body, that it bears his name as well. And as we are embarking upon a series of Bible studies that uh, reflect his message to uh, seven of the churches in the book of Revelation, and ultimately for your ch his church, your church for all time, we pray, Father, your blessing and your guidance, and uh, that uh, this would be a edifying series that helps all who listen to it and study into this subject to come to a very important and relevant message for, uh, for us today as we read these living words and apply them to us at this point in time in the church and in the body of Christ. So we ask your blessing tonight and give you thanks and we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Peter Eddington uh, kicked this off a couple of weeks ago with an overview study of the, all of the seven churches of Revelation, and I listened to it a few days ago, not being present at that study, and uh, appreciated the fact that he had covered a lot of the historical background of all of the churches in that region in, in Asia that uh, set the stage for what uh, the rest of us will cover over the next seven studies as we go through these seven churches that are referenced in Revelation 2 and 3 beginning with Ephesus and winding up all the way over here with Laodicea. So we're, uh, it's an exciting study, always has been. It's not the first time that I know many of you have been through. It's not the first time that I've, I've taught it myself. Um, but every time there's much to learn, and it's a fascinating study in, in, uh, the book of Re from the book of Revelation, from church history, and uh, certainly from the, the teaching that we can gain uh, through Christ's message to all of the churches. So... Tonight, I'm going to, to kick it off with our Bible study as we delve into the story and the message that Jesus Christ has in Revelation chapter 2 to the church of God that was founded here in the city of Ephesus. And it is the first in line uh, for a number of reasons, uh, primary of which we will talk about here for a few minutes, and the fact that uh, a Ephesus... Among not only these cities, these seven other, uh, six other cities, but the entire region of Asia and what is now Turkey was the chief city. Ephesus was the, the main city in, in the entire region. It was called the Light of Asia uh, in the ancient world. Um, 
William Barclay in his uh, bi daily Bible study series says that uh, Ephesus was Asia. And being the, the largest city and uh, centrally located on the, uh, the rivers, the trade routes that, that really emptied into Ephesus from the north, uh, from the east, and from the, the southern regions, it all came into this area of Ephesus and uh, provided uh, a very important city for that particular period of time. There was an ancient uh, geographer in the ancient world by the name of Strabo, S-T-R-A-B-O. And Strabo called Ephesus the market of Asia. And again, because of its location on the Caister River um, and also being right here as a port city um, on the, um, the Mediterranean Sea and all the other roads that were coming in, bringing commerce in and out of the, of, uh, the, the region, uh, this was the, the market of Asia. Uh, all because of all of the, the traffic and commerce that flowed through Ephesus at this particular point in time. Pergamum, I should mention, which we will get to later in the series, where there was a church and a message to the church, but the city of Pergamum was, that, was the actual capital, administrative capital for, within the Roman Empire at this time for the, the region. Ephesus was not. Um, the capital was up there. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the, the message to, to Pergamum. Uh, in fact, when a Roman governor came, was appointed and came to the region, he would come to Ephesus first. It was required that he do that, and then he would park himself in Pergamum, again, to recognize the importance of the city of, of Ephesus at this particular uh, juncture of all these roads, both the, the highways, the, the land roads, and also the the waterways of, of the time. There's another name for Ephesus that we should note. Uh, it was also known as the highway to and from Rome, and also called in later years, after even this period we're going to talk about tonight with the letter to the, to the church there, it was also called a highway of martyrs. Um, there's a letter that was written very early in the second century A.D. by a uh, one of the early church fathers, a man by the name of Ignatius. And he was um, arrested in the region, and he was going to be um, martyred in Rome. And he passed through Ephesus in that way. But he, he Ignatius, called it um, the highway of martyrs because of the Christian martyrs who would, had been a, uh, gathered in, the, in that region and then sh sent to Rome to die a martyr's death. So... Um, they all came right through the city of, uh, of Ephesus. Now, another point about the city is that it was a free city, a free city within the Roman Empire. You have to understand that uh, as the Roman Empire was the, the, uh, the big dog on the block uh, at this point in time, uh, the dominating power, uh, as they had conquered various cities throughout the region, Rome... Uh, took captives, but they also would place then garrisons of soldiers and their own administrative officials there. Certain cities, however, did not need a garrison of Roman soldiers. Ephesus was one of them, and it had the designation as a free city, which is, uh, ties into the story in the book of Acts about Ephesus as well. So it's, it's important to understand that and, and remember that, probably because of their loyalty, an extreme amount of loyalty to the Roman Empire that they were allowed to be self-governing and they wanted to, to maintain that, which is why when there's a riot there during the time of Paul, they are very, very quick to, to get on top of it and, and quell that riot so that they don't bring undue notice to them and, and jeopardize the status as a free city. So that's a very important point. Um, Ephesus was also the center of the worship of the goddess Diana one of the chief deities of the Greek and the Roman world. Either Artemis, it was another name, the, the Greek name was Artemis, Diana was the, the Roman name, and the chief uh, temple to her was situated in the city of Ephesus. It was a very grand and ornate temple. It was among what was called the seven, one of the seven wonders in the ancient world. A uh, very large and, and uh, wondrous temple. Um, Within that temple was the figure of the goddess, and uh, if you were to go to the city of Ephesus today, I haven't been there, I know that many people have on some of the tours that have been uh, conducted by the church, 
you don't see anything really left of this temple. There's a, there are a few standing columns, as I've been told, but there's, there's not much else left there, which is uh, interesting because that temple was later basically vandalized and robbed and plundered of most of its materials and taken to the city of Constantinople, um, uh, further up here to the north by the, uh, the Roman Emperor Justinian, who was building at, during his time in Constantinople uh, a huge church that became known as the Hagia Sophia. Uh, today it's still there in uh, the city of Istanbul. It is, a, is it, a, it is a Muslim mosque today, but it was built by the Emperor Justinian from materials out of the Temple of Diana in Ephesus which is, again, one reason why there's not much left for anybody to see there. You would have to go to the, to the uh, uh, temple. And th this is something from the ancient world you, you should understand. All the various temples, pagan temples uh, throughout the Greek and Roman world that were built in Athens, that were built in, in uh, Rome itself, uh, they, were, they were plundered. And they wound up in many cases in some of the larger Christian churches that were then later built in Europe and is in this case in Asia, in Constantinople. And so the, the, the marble, the gold, and other ornate furnishings wound up re, uh, being recycled. They were into uh, recycling even back then. Didn't want to let those things go to, go to waste, uh, obviously, with the, the, the cost of them. Uh, the image of Diana was one of the most sacred images uh, in the ancient world, and, and the cult worshiping her centered here was extremely important, and it was extremely lucrative. Ephesus had this dis uh, distinction with that particular temple and also it, other temples as well. There were, there were, interestingly, two other temples to two Roman emperors, Claudius and Nero, both of whom play a key role in the story of the New Testament in the book of Acts. Claudius expelled Jews from Rome. Uh, two notable Jews that, were, that we take note of in Acts were Priscilla and Aquila that uh, come in contact with Paul. Nero, who succeeded Claudius, was the emperor who, under whom Paul was martyred. So uh, Ephesus had two temples to those two Roman emperors as part of the, the cult of emperor worship that was very big at that particular time as, as well. So because of the temple of Artemis and all this other center of pagan worship, Ephesus had a very lucrative uh, economy because of their... Uh, this high, intense focus on the pagan superstitions. People came from all over the world uh, to buy amulets and, and trinkets with supposed magical power to heal and to help, uh, in some cases, help barren women become pregnant or to heal people of diseases. And it's, it's, it's key and important to understand that because in Acts 19, when the Apostle Paul is in Ephesus, you see that the, the city has this very large preoccupation with pagan spiritualism in, in one of the scenes that we have in the book of Acts where people even brought out their magic books to be burned as they were responding to the, to the true gospel. Uh, they renounced this, a lot of the superstition and sorcery and black arts and they actually burned their books uh, which contained their, their supposed secrets into the darker side of the spirit world. So this was centered in, in Ephesus. And so with the, the mixture of ethnic uh, uh, peoples there and the superstitions, the, the pagan worship, it makes for a very, very interesting city within which we begin to study this, uh, this church. And so you see the picture of, of the Temple of Artemis here and, and uh, what it contained. Um, there was a great deal of also, uh, also uh, sexual immorality that was associated with the cult of the goddess and therefore what is known as sacred prostitution, uh, immorality in the guise of, of worshiping this goddess was a, just a common part of life uh, that, that represented uh, just, a, again, the accepted features of the culture during the, during the first century in the pagan world. There's another, one other interesting fact about the temple to Diana, and it, it was also a place of asylum for criminals. Uh, you read in the Bible about a cities of refuge for people who might be wrongly accused or where there may be a case of accidental death. Cities of refuge were set up for people to flee to in which they could um, stay until the high priest died and at least had a, had a place there where they were, they were safe. 
The temple of Artemis was such a place uh, in, in the city of Ephesus and for that, for that region where criminals could flee and get asylum. So again, it created a, a refuge for all kinds of uh, evil, if you want to put it that way. Pagan superstition, immorality, black magic, and even cri the criminal sorts who could find refuge there as well. So again, an interesting mix of people in the city of Ephesus. When we come down to the, the, the church at Ephesus, we <clears throat> are looking at the story of a very interesting church. It is a very dynamic church that we read about in the Bible. It was uh, raised up by the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19, and it grew in scope because of the work that Paul did there. We, we find in Acts that he stayed there for two years, the longest known residence of Paul as a free man in his work of evangelizing the churches in the, the Roman world during that, uh, during that time. And it's probably during this time, uh, if you read in, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, uh, it was probably during this time of Paul's sojourn right here in Ephesus where, as, as we're told, people responded from the entire region as the gospel was preached. It was during this time likely that these other churches, likely the other six churches of Revelation, were actually founded as, uh, if you will, satellite churches from the, the work that began right here in Ephesus uh, as ministers and people went out to these other regions. The gospel was preached and other, other groups were raised up. So this is probably the time setting for all of these seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 to have had their birth and their, their time of, of form, formation uh, by the Apostle Paul and others uh, that were working with him um, in, in the church there. But it was, a, it was a dynamic church in a very uh, key and significant city in the, in the empire at the time. And um, when you look at the story of the church and what we are told, both from Revelation and from the rest of the Bible, there are a, a number of parallels for us to, to understand in, in our view of the church today and in, in our work. And uh, it's important, that I think, that we understand that because we know a great deal about the church at Ephesus, a great deal. In fact, we know more about the church at Ephesus than we know about Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergamum Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, or Laodicea. Why? Because of the record that we have in Scripture. Again, if you go back to Acts chapter 19 and 20, you find where Paul was, where he came to Ephesus. And we have a lot of details of the stories that took place there, uh, where, where Paul lived there for two years. Uh, even down to his farewell address to the elders of the church here uh, at Miletus, where he met them at a, a, a later time there in Acts chapter 20 and said goodbye to them knowing, as he said, that I'm, I'm not going to be coming back through here again likely. This will be the last time you will see me. Uh, here's some of my final words of advice and encouragement to you uh, right here. And so we've, we've, we know that. Secondly, we know that we have a letter addressed to the church called the book of Ephesians. And in there is a great deal of teaching to that church, which if you really read that in the context of the time and uh, other things that we know about the church, particularly chapter 2 of Revelation, you can glean, again, more insight into what was going on in the church and what, it was, what, it, what they were being taught. We also have two letters called First and Second Timothy. Timothy was the pastor of Ephesus. You read in, in the uh, first verses of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, Paul said, I left you at Ephesus. So he, we have two whole letters to the church at Ephesus with inst pastoral instruction. We call them the pastoral epistles. And in that instruction, we can also look and see that some of the issues and matters impacting the church in Ephesus during that time. That's quite a bit of information. Now, of course, then we have Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, which is the letter uh, sent there within that context from Christ and the message of, uh, to, the, to the church there, which um, uh, gives us some more information. There's one other little piece of information that we have from another writing of the Bible, the New Testament. It's the epistles of John, for 2nd and 3rd John. 
You see, after John came back from exile on the island of Patmos down here where he received the revelation from, from Jesus Christ, tradition tells us, now the Bible does not explicitly tell us this, but the uh, tradition that we do have, which is fairly, I think, fairly reliable, is that he went from Patmos to Ephesus, probably back to Ephesus. And it is there that, according to the story, he died. Now, part of the story is that he also had the mother of Christ, Mary, uh, with him, and that this is where she died as well. You remember that when Jesus was dying, he commended her to John. And so these are all part of the extra biblical traditions, but it is a fairly strong tradition that I think we can uh, learn from. If we look at 1 John, as we will a little bit later, and glean some of the things that John writes to the, to, in that letter, can give us a bit more insight into Ephesus. So we, we can say that we have more biblical information about the church at Ephesus than we have about any of the other six churches mentioned here in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. All right? So that, that's, that's important, and I, that, that's very critical to us. So let's go to Revelation chapter 2 right now. And let's look at what we are told in this very important message um, that um, is given to the angel of the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So the message is coming from Christ. We've uh, was covered in chapter 1 in the last Bible study. Uh, it is Christ's message to the churches. It is not the revelation of the Apostle John. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ to the churches. And here is where he gets down now and giving a direct, explicit message to the church in Ephesus. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience. All right, they, they have good works. They are, they are hard workers. They are a, a patient, enduring group of people. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. Now remember I said that Ephesus had a lot of evil going on in the city. With the temple of Diana being an asylum to criminals. The pagan worship that went on there. Uh, the black magic that, that caught up the city as well. Um, those members who came out of that could not bear those who are evil. Who continued in the practice of all the forms of evil that are associated with the, the sexual immorality, sorcery, criminal, criminal behavior, not to speak of, just the, the regular normal human nature of lust and envy and greed and everything else that even good middle class folk would normally be fighting as well. You had all this other dark side going on and its impact upon the culture. He said, you cannot bear those. And you have tested, he goes on, those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. All right? This is one of the first things we want to mention and understand about the church at Ephesus then for our purposes tonight. They had to deal with false teachers. We'll just call them false apostles, people who called themselves false apostles. All right? They didn't bear with them. They tested them and found them to be liars. In other words, they didn't follow them out of the church. Somebody rose up and said, I've got a better idea. My name's Ford. I've got a better idea. And let's go over here and start our own church. We'll call it the church of what's happening now. Or the church of, you know, whatever personality you might want to call it, or biblical trade or whatever. They didn't do that. They were patient, and they stayed firm where they were. He said in verse 3, You have persevered, and you have patience. And you have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So they have persevered. That's another key trait here that we want to, to um, understand is, is a key theme here. They tested the, those who claimed to be apostles, found them to be liars, and they persevered. We're going to find out what they persevered in here a little bit later. 
But, we go on, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. So this is the third theme that they left their first love. All right. These are kind of the three areas we're going to focus on here as we look at, uh, look at this story. And he tells them that, remember from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works or else I'll come to you quickly to remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Chapter 1 shows us uh, Christ standing in the midst of those, those lampstands, uh, representing the church, the various churches. But this you have, he said, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so to the first uh, church here mentioned, Ephesus, um, the tree of life that they are, they are promised to be able to eat from in the midst of the paradise of God, referencing back to Genesis, uh, is, is promised to them if they repent, if they overcome. Now, they resisted false teachers, men who claimed to be apostles. Uh, they held to the faith, uh, but were told they left their first love and they were to repent and do their first works. Just for a moment to focus on the Nicol this, this, this group called the Nicolaitans. <clears throat> We're going to see them again when we talk about the, church, the letter to the church in Pergamos. They're, they're referenced again up there. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about them. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. Um, but uh, hi historians feel that this was a, a group of people that were associated with the Gnosticism that was rampant during this particular uh, period of time. Uh, people with a special knowledge, a special revelation, um, and mixed in with a, all kinds of other practices that essentially <clears throat> allowed them in their, their way of thinking and their particular brand of Christianity was to be able to participate in any type of libertine behavior that they wanted. And again, the city had plenty that they could choose from. Uh, but allow them in their own thinking to still be called righteous, to still be a part of the church, uh, st still be considered a Christian, and yet participate by their choosing and degrees into the pagan society and participate even in the Roman civil religion. Uh, this is what some feel th this particular group um, seems to summarize and, and evidence. And uh, we'll probably talk about more about them when we come back to, to them in the, in the uh, letter to the church at Pergamum, but um, they were uh, Christians who wanted to have it both ways. And probably pe people with that uh, was kind of an idea that it didn't matter what you did in the flesh. You could do whatever you want in terms of morality in the flesh, as long as you professed, and in, in, in your, your you know, mind, if you professed God or Christ or the faith, you could do whatever you wanted because the Spirit dominated and trumped anything done in the flesh. Those were particular ideas that were prevalent as a part of Gnosticism in this period of time and had unique expressions through various groups like these known as the Nicolaitans. We don't know a whole lot about them except from scraps of information that we get from early history, but this is generally what is felt along with the message that we have. So we'll leave that and let's go back and dig a little deeper into this uh, story of the church at Ephesus to put some flesh on the, the bones of these particular ideas that the letter addresses within the church. Let's go back to the book of Acts uh, to begin with, Acts chapter 19. And, and in, a, in a quick summary, look at it here. As I've already mentioned, a region-wide work was done uh, when Paul came to Ephesus and found 12 disciples, and he baptized them. And you have the nucleus of a church. They had been disciples with only the baptism of John, and they were, in a sense, rebaptized. And with the laying on of hands, received the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. And um, Paul began to reside there, and a, a large work began to grow up. And we're we, we know from that uh, also in, in Acts 19 that uh, many miracles were a part of, of Paul's ministry. People were healed. Demons were cast out. And we, we find that, again, 
that would be normally expected because of the emphasis upon the sorcery and the black arts within the population, and also the emotional condition of the population as well. People who would be caught up in that practice would have certain emotional uh, proclivities that were not, let's say, shall we say, balanced. And that comes out in, in what you read in Acts 19 and, and 20 as, as well. Uh, and, but there was a great response to the gospel. This is what Acts 19 tells us. So much so that people brought out their books, had them burned, indicating that there was a great need for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. In Acts 19 and verse 17, we are told that God's name was highly magnified and honored in Ephesus. And verse 17 of Acts 19 really kind of summarizes uh, the response that the uh, people had there and something that characterizes the church um, in, in the city of Ephesus. Acts 19 and verse 17, um, this became known to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing, telling their deeds, burning their books. Verse 20 tells us the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The people responded to the work of the preaching of the gospel. There was a great need and a great hunger for that. Uh, it was so large that the entire economy of the city seemed to be impacted because when we come down to verses 23 through 27, we find that there was one Demetrius, a silversmith, whose income and that of other silversmiths who crafted these images of Diana and sold them, their income began to be hurt. They had the big hurt put on them. And you know, you know the story, I mean, you know, you know the line, follow the money. You want to understand certain things, they say, follow the money. Always follow the money. This is a great story where you follow the money and you realize that the work Paul was doing was large enough and significant enough that it was getting into the pocketbooks of this guild of silversmiths. And they reacted. And they, they made these charges against, um, against Paul. This gives us a key indicator of the work that was being done. Remember, Acts two, or Revelation 2, what does Jesus tell the church? Repent and do the first... Anybody with me? Time to wake up. The first works. The first works. Repent and do the first works is what He said to do. What were the first works? You read it here in Acts 19. A great response to the message of the gospel. People coming into the church. People renouncing uh, immorality, paganism the cult of the emperor, the cult of Diana, burning their books, turning from a life of darkness to the, to the light. This is, is showing uh, exactly how strong this was taking place. Now, in chapter 20, I mentioned Paul's last visit where he came, uh, he had left Ephesus and come, uh, went on a little uh, soiree through the region, but he was going back to Jerusalem and Acts 20 shows us stopping at Miletus, and he calls for the church, the elders, to come down. And it's in a very moving uh, passage in Acts 20 where Paul says, you're not going to see me anymore. But he gives them this warning of false teachers. He said, after my departing, false teachers are going to come in and rise up out of your midst. Don't follow them. False apostles. The church resisted false apostles and found them to be liars, we're told in Revelation 2. That's the very warning Paul gave to them, to the, to the elders there. And he said, you're going to have false ministers rise up from among you after my departing. Don't follow them. They didn't. Christ later, a few years later, Roughly 30 years later, when he gives this message through John, he says, you, found, you, did not, you stood up to these false leaders. What Paul predicted came to pass, and they, the church withstood them. You ever stop to think how the church that we are a part of today 
would be so much different through the last 20 years of our own time space. Had more members and a good deal more elders stood up to false apostles, false leaders, and said, you're liars. You are a liar. Beginning 20 years ago, and in other subsequent episodes since, how different would our fellowship, our church, be had more people, more members, and more ministers recognize false apostles, false ministers, wolves in sheep's clothing, and said to them, you are a liar, and called them out instead of believing the lie, whether it was a doctrinal lie or a personal slander against individuals or against a group. How different would it be today? The Ephesian church stood up to them, and Christ commended them for it. The second piece of evidence that we have from the New Testament is the letter at Ephesus, the letter to the Ephesians. You see, after Paul came through Miletus, he goes to Jerusalem and he gets himself arrested. And over, after circumstances, he winds up imprisoned over in Rome. And it's in Rome that he writes the letter back to the church in Ephesus. And we have it in our, in our Bible today. In the book of Ephesus, we read Paul telling the church and talking about the grace of God. He reminds them of the power of Christ's resurrection. He tells them that that is a very key and important doctrine. He also tells them in chapter 2 and verse 10 of Ephesians that they have been created for good works. Again, Christ commends them in Revelation 2 for their labor, their patience, and their, their good works. Paul tells them that they are raised up to, to set together. And in, in, in essence, if you compare Ephesians back with what you read in, in, Acts 2, in Acts 19, you see that what he writes to them a few years later are the core teachings that moved them to come into the church at the beginning. Core teachings about the resurrection, about Christ being the head of the church, about their common role to, to, to be together. And it was among those teachings where they persevered. They held on to them. They understood what it meant to understand that there were, some were given to be apostles, some teachers, as Ephesians 4 talks about. <clears throat> and they caught the vision of how that each part of the, the church in Ephesians 4.16 supplied that which knit together the, the, the church. Because they persevered, they held together, they resisted false apostles and, and found them to be liars. The church had bonded together, and they would not let anything uh, dis deter them from that, and they did not move off of sound doctrine and, and sound teaching. The people who came into the church in Ephesus had, were coming out of a pagan cult culture <clears throat> as Gentiles that was completely exhausted. <clears throat> Even the Romans in this first century world were realizing just how exhausted the pagan cults were. <laughs> in, in, in some cases, in, in Rome especially, they were even importing old cults from, from Egypt, the cult of Isis, calling it new, building new temples, even in Rome, to Isis, just to get something new. Because their old gods, their old pagan cults, had proved to be worthless and were exhausted in, with hope. When the people came out of all of that and came in and responded to the gospel, they were looking for something that was, that was far better, far greater hope, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and they responded to it, and they held on to it. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, also tells us something else. That Paul gives instruction in chapter 4 about being kind to one another, not letting bitterness take over, not letting even, really, if you read, read carefully what he's showing, he said, don't let the culture the pagan culture of, of the Roman world divide you against each other. In chapter 6 of Ephesians, in that very famous section in verse uh, 12, where he says, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
He tells them that. And really what he's saying is, don't fight against yourselves. Resist Satan. Your real fight is against spiritual wickedness in high places. Don't get involved in fights that divide you against yourself. Hold fast. Labor hard. Stay together. Hold the line. Hold the line. And they did. They did. And this is what they needed to understand. Now let's move quickly to the next bit of evidence, which is the letters to Timothy that we have. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> verses um, 3 and 4, we find where Paul tells Timothy, I'm leaving you in Ephesus, and here's why. You ever made this connection here? He said in verse 3, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. Paul had told the elders, Beware wolves in sheep's clothing. They're going to rise up in the, in the midst and in, inject false doctrine. He tells Timothy, Charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in, which is in faith. So Paul goes through First and Second Timothy, two letters to the pastor at Ephesus to tell them, tell him, look, you preach sound doctrine. You preach as you've been taught. Don't get caught up in, in, in um, fables, endless genealogies, things that lead to disputes rather than godly edification or the, the, the godly building together of a group of people, knit, knitting them together by that which every joint supplies and causing them to persevere. The church at Ephesus held the line against false teaching. Their pastor, in those initial years, Timothy, was charged with that responsibility. And they did that. The letter from, that Christ gave them of commendation uh, verifies that. And this is it. That's in the 90s. So from the 50s, roughly 30 to 40 years later, by the record of the Bible, we can see that the, the church did persevere and they held on to, to uh, tight doctrine. And, and uh, in, in Timothy, Paul goes through and, and tells them a great deal about that. He, um, he, tells them, he told Timothy that if you fall for false teachers in your midst, you'll, you'll fall for uh, many other things. Uh, he tells Timothy to pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and endurance uh, and gentleness. In, in chapter 1 here in verses 5 and 6, he, he, he mentions something very interesting. He says, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart from a good conscience and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. Pure love from a pure heart. Love from a pure heart. What was, the, what was it that Christ says to the church at Ephesus? They left their first love. The heading for this study, the loveless church. Timothy is admonished, hold on to a, a, a pure love. The purpose of the commandment is to bring that. As you, as you hold on to sound doctrine and resist those who inject false teaching and make outlandish claims of, of authority and superiority, you will be holding fast and firm in the way of a, of a pure heart and engendering love. In, in truth, but there's, there's a very interesting side effect that often sets in. We'll come back to that. Paul warns Timothy to deal with false teachers, and he, he basically says don't let false teaching of any kind get a toehold within the church. If this happens, as he shows, the love of members will wax cold. I want you to think about it. People who claim to be apostles and are found to be liars, false teachers, trying to divide and lead people away. And inevitably, they, they, they make certain inroads. And then years of persevering and holding on, there's a tension that is created here. Think about our own experience. Think about 20 years of holding on to sound doctrine, reproving things that went through a period of, of um, denial, holding on to it, living it, fighting for it in many ways, 
and even dealing then with people who make claims to, uh, of authority and, and try to divide and separate the church. There's a tension that year after year will have its impact, which is why Paul says to Timothy, don't, don't let this get a toehold in the church. Because in, inevitably it will impact the love and the bonds of love among people. There will be a weariness that, that will set in. Now, the Ephesian church is commended for what they have to deal with, but uh, there are some indications that, indications that that endurance comes at a price. It comes at a price. Paul will later say that, that a lot of people have forsaken him in, the, in this region, and he stands alone in his final imprisonment, nobody standing with him. All in Asia have forsaken me, he said. Um, but there, there are, there's a core group here that holds, holds on for quite a long period of time. Um, you know, when Paul tells Timothy, don't get caught up in false doctrine. Preach as you've been taught. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That has a big lesson for us today. We have 20 fundamentals of belief in the United Church of God. They're very important to us. We have a process for dealing with uh, ideas that might arise from member or minister alike if uh, there's a different teaching other than what we have been taught and accepted in the church, uh, by which that can be examined and the merits or <clears throat> the lack thereof can be determined by a, a responsible a group of elders. We have a process that every minister must live by. And it is in, geared to, to protect the integrity of our doctrinal teaching. Every year when I teach the fundamentals at the Ambassador Bible College, I explain what it takes to change a doctrine of the church. Three quarters of the ministers must agree to it. Folks, three quarters of our ministry haven't agreed to anything. <laughs> sometimes, much less the idea of changing one of our fundamentals of belief. Now, that speaks to what we have in place, and it's important that we in the ministry, as we teach, we respect that process, and we don't go off teaching our own ideas, or even subtly injecting our own ideas that are different from what we have taught and hold and teach in our literature uh, and our belief system within the church. No minister, frankly, has that right to do that publicly. We all have a, we can, we can study the Bible and perhaps hold by our conscience our own ideas. Uh, I, I will allow that. And I think God, you know, that, that's, that's where we are. But in terms of a minister teaching or even a member promoting teaching and ideas that are contrary, to our established doctrinal teaching, it creates division. We have a process. If someone feels they have a better teaching, put it to the test and prove it. But don't go into the church and, and don't then try either by subtle other means of even, even lifestyle and or coffee table chatter uh, to promote teachings that ultimately will divide the church and create problems. It's wrong. It's not biblical. And all of us need to understand that because, as I said earlier, had more members through the recent decades stood up to that, they wouldn't have been carried away with every wind of doctrine and slight of men. And we would be a, a different church as a result. Well, I mentioned that the letter from the Apostle John called 1 John also uh, it was, uh, can be associated with the, the church in Ephesus by virtue of Paul or John being there in his last years by tradition. And if you look at the message in 1 John, it's very interesting. John's the epistle of love. But he also talks about antichrists. He actually talks about an antichrist and then antichrists. One antichrist and then many antichrists. False teachers. And he basically shows that if you, you know, he said, beware of them. They, 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 they will come from among you, and then they'll go out. 
And he says that's one of, you know, that indicator they were never really of us. And he's, he basically is saying that if you fall for false teachers in your midst, you'll fall for the great Antichrist to come. If you fall for the little Antichrist, the little false lying apostles and leaders would be, you'll fall for the big one too because you'll be buying into a lie in one form or the other, not holding to sound doctrine. And he, he very clearly shows that true godly righteousness involves obeying the commands of God in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. And to practice true righteousness, you must have a deep love for one another, he says in 1 John 3 and verse 10. So John touches on the commandments and holding fast to, to true teaching and loving one another and letting that practice of pure religion and true religion also help to develop that love for one another as well as the love for God. That's all through 1 John. If that, if that did, did go to the church at Ephesus, even into the 90s, we have teaching from John to shore up the whole story that begins with Paul's ministry there, Timothy's instruction, and the letter that Jesus and the commendation Jesus gave to the church in Ephesus to resist Antichrist, identify him, don't go after them, hold, hold on to the commandments and to the true teaching, and love one another. But the Ephesian church had left their first love, Christ says. They had resisted false apostles. They had persevered. They held to true doctrine, just as we have. Just as we have. And the question perhaps for us to consider tonight as we study this letter to the Ephesian church is, have we left our, how, has our love, first love, any part of our love, second love, third love, first love, last love, however we want to define it, has any part of our love for God and for each other been impacted by tension caused by false teachers and division and holding fast to true teaching and doctrine? Well, I think we have to be honest that the, the tension is there and if we, if we give in to that tension, that stress, by not staying close to God, not understanding the biblical record, not understanding what Jesus says to the, to the church at Ephesus and by extension to the church at, all, at, at any time and especially to us today as we read this message and all the other messages and glean an understanding for us and what it means for us today, why it's relevant, there is a very important lesson that I have to bring out to us and we all have to, to look at uh, when it comes to our love for one another and our love for God. Has it, has it been impacted in any way by any of these other matters? As it seems to have impacted the church at Ephesus. He said, repent and do the first works. Now, if the first works involved any part of this first love, what does the record of the scriptures tell us? Was the first works of the people in the church at Ephesus. Go back to Acts chapter 19 and verse 17. <clears throat> Acts 19 verse 17. This became known to the Jews and to the Greeks. These works, these miracles, this preaching, uh, the, the, work, the miracles God worked at the hands of Paul and his teaching about the kingdom of God and all the, the, the doctrines that, that, uh, that he taught them. As this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And again, a great work was done as people cast off the works of darkness and moved toward the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And as they began to move out of that culture, the pagan world of the first century, and no longer walk according to those ways of, of their, their neighbors and their past associations. Because in, in, in Ephesians 2, I didn't intend to turn to this, but it, it, it just reminded me in Ephesians 2, 
Verse 1, Paul says, you, You've been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Those members in Ephesus once walked in those ways. They went to the Roman baths, which were baths and gymnasiums and pagan shrines and places of all kinds of lewd behavior. But it was an everyday part of life. They had walked into the temple of Diana. They had engaged in, in sacred prostitution, thinking that they were worshiping the goddess and it was okay. And what that did to a mind over a period of time and as they dabbled with black arts, these, this is what Paul is talking about, that where you once walked according to this world. And he tells them to come out of, come out of that. And don't walk that way. In chapter 5 and verse 8 of Ephesians, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. These are the first works that they were admonished to go back to and to remember. And in that sense, rekindle a first love. Let me tell you something. A first love is far more than whatever emotional feeling you may have had when you first came to know the truth and first came into the church. Whatever it was you felt then and there is not exactly the, the sum total of a definition of the first love. You can never go back to that. You can never be 18 again, 28, or have that emotion again. But you can do the first works. You can understand the love for the truth, whether you're 18, 28, 48, or 63, going on 64. You can have that at any time. You can have a love for God and, and kindle and rekindle and, and go deeper into a commitment to God's way of life, and to a deeper understanding of it at any age, at any point, and that be classified in a sense as your, your works, your, your first works, and you're your walking toward that light. Our first love is more than an emotional feeling we had when we were first called. In Acts, we see examples of people burning their books of darkness and abandoning idolatry, coming out of the dark, dominant, pagan Roman culture of the first century and moving toward the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. They're all in. No turning back. That's what they were to turn back to, and that's what we should learn, I think, from the, le the, the letter to the church. That we must rekindle that, those first works and a love for the works of God in our life and what it can mean for others. That can come to us at any time. And if at any time we find ourselves wavering in that because of the stress, the doubt, the fear, the uncertainty, the irritation, yes, even the anger that might come from holding fast or seeing doctrine challenged by some or where false ministers, wolves in sheep's clothing, have arisen and told lies and led people off and had that emotional impact and drain on us, we can move beyond all of that. We can, re we can regain that first love by doing the first works. That's what needs to be done. That's the question that we need to ask ourselves when we put our hearts and our minds to seek only the kingdom of God and its righteousness. In conclusion, let's go back to Revelation chapter 2. And read verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's take to heart this letter to the Ephesian church. Let's take to heart the letter to all the other six churches that we will be going through in the coming weeks. And especially as it says here, let's make sure that we're eating from and enjoying of the fruits of the tree of life that God has called us to the light of the glorious gospel. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Be careful as you drive home, and uh, hope you have a good rest of your week.